Hi, um, my name's Eric Carr, and like Drew said, I'm a, a sales engineer. I work with the Alliances team at Looker, and my specialty is ML and AI. Um, today we're going to talk about some exciting things that we're doing with AWS SageMaker. Um, Looker has something called the Action Hub that we'll actually look at and how that integrates with SageMaker and the exciting things that we're doing to kind of automate the machine learning process and make it more accessible to everybody in the company, not just the data scientists who live in Python, but to business users and marketing analysts and business analysts and people who don't live and breathe Python on a daily basis, right? So. Um, a little bit of background about me. I come from a consulting background. I worked primarily with SAP software, data services, ETL, data architecture, um, before I got into Looker, right? So I, I know a lot about the consulting world. I know a lot about the data architecture world. I didn't know a lot about machine learning up until uh, I did a program. I did my master's program at UIUC in data science, and that really got me excited about machine learning and AI. And I, I wanted to get that into Looker as well. So I've been spearheading this year a program to make it really easy for people in Looker to integrate with some of the new software that's coming out, SageMaker, uh, BigQuery ML, um, what else, uh, AutoML from Google, um, eventually some maybe with Azure or DataRobot, uh, BigSquid, companies like that. Just make it really easy to get your data into an AI or machine learning platform. Right? So how many people here have actually heard of Looker before? Wow, that's a lot. Awesome. How many people have heard of SageMaker? Okay, a little bit less. Um, well, we're going to talk about what Looker is first. So next slide. <laughs> uh, what is Looker and how did we get here, right? <laughs> It'd be easier if I had a clicker, right? Um, so. I'm going to have to read this slide because it's changing so rapidly that I don't remember what these numbers are, right? Uh, Looker has over 1,600 customers. We just got uh, a another round of funding, so we have $280.5 million in funding from Capital G and Pivot North, um, Sapphire, um, you know, Geodesic, people that can really help spearhead how data is used, right? And they understand it. They understand the world around data. 600 employees when I started uh, was a little over a year ago, and it was about 350. So you can see that we're actually growing pretty rapidly. We've got global offices in Santa Cruz, in San Francisco, Dublin, London, New York, Boulder, Chicago, and Tokyo. We just added five people in Tokyo last week right, to start this new year. It's an amazing growth. Um, and we've got major partnerships with all of the, the big players. So we, we don't just work with AWS. We don't just work with Google. We also have Cloudera, Microsoft. Uh, HPE, IBM, um, IBM Data Science and Watson, we have integrations with that as well that are ongoing. And then um, something that may be relevant to you guys here, one in five of our customers are coming from outside the US now. So what's different about Looker, right? Looker is a BI platform, but what makes it different than other BI platforms like Tableau or like Click or you know, Power BI, something like that? We think that We've got a new way of doing things, right? So in the legacy world, in the SAP world that I would come from, you would take a while to implement things. You'd need a team of consultants. You'd have to set up a, an entire set of semantics and set up a new database and get your data into uh, a new BI platform. And that was because databases were slow and expensive at the time, right? Databases have gotten much faster. And, and you know, the problem that that caused was at when you had to have a team of IT engineers or consultants to get your data into a BI platform, that caused a bottleneck. We came along with Tableau and Click, and they said, we want self-service. We don't want this bottleneck anymore. And so we gave data to everybody. That caused a bit of data chaos. So now you've got everybody with access to the data, and that was really cool, and people could do whatever they wanted, but they could do whatever they wanted. <laughs> That's not always good. So you've got numbers that don't match. And one of the other things that you saw in that second wave of BI was that people started taking data out of the database where it lived and bringing it into some sort of proprietary in-memory engine. They pulled it out into Tableau and tried to do something with it. And that's great. It was faster. But it didn't really scale. So Looker comes along. We call ourselves the third wave of BI because we looked at it and we saw that, or we made a bet, that SQL was really the way to go, that cloud databases were going to get faster and faster and that adoption was going to really, really pick up. So we made a bet on those factors. We made a bet that 
uh, data should stay in the database, that the database could be the engine that actually drove everything. So we didn't need a heavyweight layer. We didn't need to extract all the data. We also made a bet that the data chaos that was happening with something like Tableau or like Click um, needed some governance, right? We needed to have governed rules and sta stability. We needed a semantic layer. And we made a bet on technology. We made a bet that cloud databases were only going to get better, that the, the adoption was going to, to just drive forward. So um, the semantic layer is, is looking well. We probably won't get into that today. But uh, we have a, a comprehensive, uh, if you're familiar with business objects, that's my world. Uh, they have a universe. Um, we have something called LookML that lets you kind of define what your data looks like and then give it out to users. You can do that. What's Looker look like from an architectural standpoint? Well, you've got data in a lot of systems. Um, we want to extract that into a SQL database, any SQL database. We don't care as long as it speaks standard SQL. We support right now, I think, uh, 47 different dialects of SQL, everything from PrestoDB to Snowflake to uh, Google BigQuery, uh, Redshift, Athena, Aurora, et cetera. Looker comes in at this purple layer, right? So we've got this agile modeling layer that we just talked about. That's the LookML. That's your semantic layer. And everything that you do with your BI platform, whether that's ML and sending it down to SageMaker or, or BigQuery ML, um, or just doing BI reporting and allowing exploration of that data, plugs into the agile modeling layer. So you can't do anything without it, right? We're not letting people write SQL queries and, and throw them out there. You don't have to. Looker will write the SQL for you. We are very tightly integrated with Git for version control. A lot of people think that's really cool. I think it's really cool. So now I can collaborate with people to build out my semantic layer. Now I can control it. I can roll it back if I break something, right? Um, and we use standard JDBC connectors. So every time we find a new database that we want to add, it's relatively straightforward for us to add that in and add that dialect support as well. Um, and then Looker also provides as an application user management and security because we need to make sure that people are seeing only the data that they should see and everybody's seeing that data um, correctly, right? Anything you're doing, web interface, self-service exploration, wow, we're great with embed. Like 30% of our use cases right now are people embedding Looker um, in their own application, in their portal, or some application that they're, they're selling to other people. And Looker provides that engine that they can use for the visualization, yes, but also for the governance and the data, the data prep, right? Um, we provide the scheduled delivery, and we provide a very comprehensive REST API, right? So anything that you can do in the application, you can probably do programmatically as well. And what does that mean, right? So the platform is the common source. Everything that you're doing in Looker data applications, embed, AI, ML, you're reporting, right? All of it is being fed from the Looker app. You plug it into whatever sources you have. You have the semantic layer that's going to transform it. Looker writes SQL. It sends it to the database. The database does the heavy lifting. It sends it back to Looker, and then you visit. Right? So we made a bet that all of this data would need to be surfaced, but it needed to be surfaced in a unified way. And this is what we're doing with SageMaker as well. So what's SageMaker, and what can it do for me? Um, well, it's AWS's, Amazon's web um, based machine learning platform. It automates the creation of Jupyter notebooks on EC2 instances that are optimized for machine learning. So you can spin one up and spin it down and not spend a ton of money on EC2 instance every month, right? Um, it provides customized libraries and algorithms for common ML tasks. So things that you're going to do like binary classification or linear regression or logistic regression or multi class classification, image recognition, et cetera. It probably has some sort of algorithm optimized for SageMaker that you can send data to, S3, and then you can spin up a SageMaker instance to run training on it, to run inference on it, to stand up an endpoint so that you can send a, a new data set and get a prediction or an inference from it as well, right? It automates all of these in, in, uh, the ML tasks using data and, in S3 buckets, so storage is incredibly cheap. You probably already store stuff there, um, and you can just shoot it over, run your ML, train the model. And then it provides, this is the most important part for us, an API for integration. So I can call the API, I can send data down to S3, and I can say, hey, SageMaker, train a model on this. Here's my target. Here's my type of classification or regression that I'm doing. Um, put together a trained model, let me know when it's done. And then I can infer on top of that. I can put together predictions. 
So why, why use Looker instead of like Python? Well, you can use both. <laughs> um, in fact, I, if we have time, I'll show you uh, a Jupyter notebook that actually uses Looker as the data source and does all of, you can live in Python if you are comfortable with Python. You can live in R if you're comfortable in R. But we like to make it more democratic um, in such a way that if you've built a model, you've trained a model, your business user can then feed a new data source in. They've run a query. They've got some new data. They want to know what the predictions look like. You don't have to call your data scientist and say, hey, can you run this for me? And pass them a CSV file. And they take it, and they munge it, and they do feature engineering, and they run the algorithm, and they give you back your predictions. You say, oh, but uh, you need to change this. right? So they can do that themselves using Looker as the interface. Uh, it also allows them to explore. So exploration in Python is possible, but you kind of have to know the language. You need to know how to visualize, right? You need to kind of know what you're looking for. And Looker's not going to change that. You kind of need to kind of know what you're looking for, but it's going to make the visualization easier, right? Um, we can give you a model. We can let you play with it. You can make some inferences, and then you talk to your data scientists and say, hey, I think that this looks like something we should explore. Can we do that? We can send the results of our query right down to SageMaker and train the new model. Or we can send it down and we can refine our model. And then we can also use that trained model for SageMaker to infer predictions. We're actually going to see this in a live demo. Um, and then we have a little dashboard that you can stand on top of it so that you can look at how well your predictions are performing. How well did I do once I know, right? Cool. So why don't we take a look? No, probably grab a chair. And we'll see how well I can hold this and demo at the same time. Manual dexterity test. So first of all, um, this is Looker. If you haven't seen it before, it's a pretty common interface between all of the Looker instances that you might be using. You have Browse Explorer and develops, uh, meaning basically user personas that are going to be in the system and using it. Browsers are consumers. Explorers are your power users, the people who are creating content or asking ad hoc query questions. And then developers are your actual data architects or DBAs who are going to be using the tool to create those models that other people consume, right? So that's that semantic layer, right? Um, so what we did for this particular demo is I took some data from, um, from a bank, a marketing um, test, it's just publicly available data, and I dropped it into S3 and built an Athena database on top of that. So Looker will sit on top of Athena, just like any other SQL database, and I can begin to look at the data. So we'll come in and we'll look at, actually, what's our original data set look like? So what we're doing here is we're trying to see, based on a number of features that are available in our data set, what, whether or not customers um, will accept a new term deposit when offered. So typical data science problem. I've got my feature, uh, my information. I know that um, my yes knows. I've got a couple of numeric features, but most of them are categorical. And I, I personally know that SageMaker is going to choke on all of those if I try to give them categorical data without doing something with it. Um, in Python, I would come in and one hot encode this. So I can do that in Looker as well, right? We'll go back and look at what Looker's model of a Monge data set might look like. So same kind of thing you would be doing in a Python notebook, right? I'm going to turn my yes, no's into zero, ones because my target feature needs to be binary. We're going to do binary classification on this. Um, I take my numerics and leave them as is. I code some non-NAs into uh, an arbitrary number, minus 999. Um, and then I one hot encoded all of my features. So I've determined that these features are probably the ones that are most predictive. And I did that through some exploration. And we won't go through the full exploration of all of this data. We'll just look at a couple of them. Um, I put together a couple looks while I was looking at this data to see if maybe my target might be affected by education level. I expected that it would. It kind of looks like it is. Looks like there's a larger percentage of university grads that accept than not. Um, I looked at seasonality. 
So I wanted to see whether or not my target months uh, had anything to do with whether or not people accepted it. Then I could take my marketing campaign and only offer it in maybe October, right? It saved me a lot of money. Um, so I did see some seasonality, but it seems to be in clusters. So what I did with my features is I engineered them to not be month by month. It wouldn't have given me very interesting data, but I grouped them by quarter. It looks like quarters are more interesting and more useful. And there's one more here. I don't know where I put it. Let's see. Ah, how many times we called them? That seems like something that would be very predictive of whether or not they took that term deposit. And it is up to a certain point. After about 25 campaign touches, it really falls off, right? Nobody wants to be called constantly to take a term deposit. They kind of got fed up and said no. That makes sense. So then, what else would I do in, in Python, right? I'd split into train and test. Um, probably want to do eh, 70, 30. Pick a number. I split 70, 30. And I put together two queries based on my data um, and a random seed so that I would have a random 70, 30%. And then I'm going to send this down to SageMaker. So I take this and I say send. And I have this SageMaker train. And what we're not seeing in the background is me setting up um, my buckets, right? In Amazon, I need a place to drop things. I need a, uh, an access key. Uh, once I have that, then I'll have access through this Action Hub integration to choose a bucket. So this is my uh, connection using a security key that I created. Um, and I can choose something like SageMaker models and drop that into my bucket. Right now we're supporting XGBoost and Linear Learner, two of SageMaker's algorithms that do multi-class binary and I think Linear Learner also does linear regression. Um, but for this we'll choose XGBoost because I know that my data is kind of uneven. And then it's gonna send a CSV file down to SageMaker. I wanna take all of my results and I don't really need any visualization formats. I don't need dots, periods, et cetera. It's all pretty much binary data. And then I send. Ooh, that was easy. Over here in SageMaker, after it runs that query, we'll see that eventually it'll update with an in progress. There we go, training job. So it's gonna take this training job. Um, this has some hard-coded right now. This is a beta feature, so it's got some hard-coded hyperparameters. You can check out what those are. If you wanna make changes to them, um, eventually we'll have the option for people to actually change their hyperparameters based on the algorithm that they're using, or even run a hyperparameter tuning uh, job as well to use that as a trained model. Um, right now, it's still, still being fleshed out, um, but we, we chose some. Um, we're gonna run this 100 times for a binary alert binary logistic outcome. And then in SageMaker, you can come and you can watch the training. This one only takes about three minutes, but you can imagine if you had a much larger data set that you might want to kind of watch it as you went along. Um, and SageMaker gives you the ability to, to view what your algorithm is looking like, what your algorithm metrics look like in their CloudWatch logging process. After about three minutes, it'll be finished. So what do we do once we have a trained model? Well, we'll go, I may have uh, sent down test data. It's okay. Do something of the same thing, right? So um, in SageMaker with the API, it expects your data in a very specific format. I need to give it my target variable first and all of my features afterwards. And I need all of those features to be in a format that's consistent with the algorithm itself. So I've already done that ahead of time. For test, it wants me to drop the target. I can't send that down, right? Um, there are some limitations right now with AWS that they're going to add on to over time. I think you'll be able to also send you know, uh, more complicated data sets down and specify for the algorithm how you'd like it used. But for now, we set up our query so that we have all of the same features that we sent in for training and we just drop the target. Pretty easy to do in Looker. I can just go to the column and you know, hide it. And if I go to hide a column in, in Looker, I click and then click remove from query. Voila, pretty easy. So now with this test, 
here. I do the same thing, but I have this inference, right? And I can choose the same bucket, and I can choose what models might be there. So I'll pick a model. Again, we want all of those test records to go down. And again, that goes down and does a batch inference job here, or a batch transform. And if everything works correctly, then you'll have one in progress that eventually will finish. Um, I think I've, I've had several mistakes in this one, so I should probably go back to my data set and figure out what's going on. Um, but I have one that is already finished that we can take a look at. So it gives me a list of predictions. Those predictions are numeric for this particular algorithm. So instead of a 0 or a 1, I get some range between 0 and 1. And then I can decide within Looker what I want my cutoff to be. So we put together a little classification dashboard as well so that we can see how this performs in real life. So based on what I predicted with a cutoff of 0.5, meaning anything above 0.5 would be a yes and anything below would be a no. I have a 0.8980 area under the curve, which is not bad for a non-hyperparameter tune job. Um, and then I have my confusion matrix, right? In this particular case, I'm more interested in specificity because I have a highly negatively skewed data set. So um, more interested in whether or not if I predict negative, it's actually negative, than whether or not I predict positive, it's actually positive. Didn't do so well on that one, 0.6338. I don't have nearly enough data to, to get in a, a, a good um, algorithm there. But I could look at this as well with Looker, and I can say, well, what happens if maybe I'm skewed in some way and I, I change this to 0.45? What does that look like? And it's really only going to change my AUC, because my cutoff metric. It's not too bad, too. If I say 0.75, even better. So I can look at how my metric is performing and maybe adjust what my cutoff looks like in the algorithm itself. Or I can say that none of this is working very well. I can look at another uh, training job or inference job that I built with different hyperparameters and compare them. Cool. So that's, that's our integration. I wanted to also talk for a second about um, the fact that it's not just SageMaker. So we, we are not just integrated with Amazon right now. Um, we do have a BQML as well. Um, so the nice thing about BQML and Looker is that the BQML algorithm integrates some regression, logistic and linear, into SQL itself. Um, and Looker sits on SQL. So what I can do is, in Looker, I can create a model using the SQL commands for BQML and then use those in line with my queries. Right? So I can actually predict in line with what I have. SageMaker is still very batch, um, but that batch is very useful for large machine learning and for more complicated multi-class classification, image recognition, things like that. BQML is still very limited in terms of what it can do. But we integrate directly with it. We're one of um, we're the only one who integrates in line with it. Tableau will do it via a connection, um, but Looker will let you write the SQL directly and create those models. So I think, I think we're good. Um, I'll open it up to questions. Do you need multiple, uh, do you use multiple data stores, or does it have to be one single source of truth? Or is there do, can you use multiple data stores in Looker, or does it have to be a single source of truth? It's, um, typically, what we'll see is people consolidate information into a single um, location or database, right? Um, but I could have multiple tables or multiple uh, data sources within, say, Athena, and connect those together. I could, also, um, I could also stitch certain results together in Looker. So if, let's say, I've got BigQuery, I've got uh, Redshift, and I've got um, Postgres, um, on site, and I need to put all of those together, but I can't put together an ETL pipeline. Just for whatever reason, I just can't do it. Looker will let you stitch it together on the front end um, with some limitations, right? It's still going to do most of its work in database. I can stitch together 5,000 results at a time. Uh, typically, that means that I'll need some sort of aggregated data set beforehand. Great, great question. Anyone else? All right. All right. We'll move along. Thank you.